going to go ahead and get started. I just want to welcome everyone and introduce myself once again. My name is Esosa Gadara. I'm one of the co-founders of Black Women Talk Tech. Well, our mission is to help Black women build the next billion dollar company. And the way we do that is to help you with resources and um, support network and really connect you to investors. And so we're super excited to have all of you here. We have esteemed guests here talking through some really good conversations around our half day event on fundraising. So um, really just going from an entrepreneur to an investor and how to turn your no's into a yes and why betting on black women matters. So I'm going to go ahead and first introduce everyone. We'll start with Kimberly Page, a seasoned brand marketer and general manager for over 25 years of experience. Kimberly Page is widely recognized as a leading business executive that is known for driving transformative growth among existing and emerging brands and companies. Ms. Page is currently the senior executive at Viacom CBS and EVP uh, chief marketing officer BT Networks. In her role, she is responsible for managing and implementing brand strategies across all platforms, including BT, BT Her, Networks, BT Streaming, and BT Social, and the highly successful BT Live Events business. Thank you also, BT, for allowing us to be, this to actually exist and be here. And so we're super excited to have you. And thank you, Kimberly. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Uh, next up, we have Kimberly Blackwell. Kimberly Blackwell is the founder, investor, and philanthropist. With over 20 years in CPG, Ms. Blackwell is heralded as one of the country's most top executives in new media, marketing, and advertising. As the CEO of an omni-channel brand agency, PMM, Kimberly's been called a powerhouse. And with experience in startup to scale for consumer product goods companies, Ms. Blackwell is a founding member and serves as a founding investor and advisory member to the recently enlisted Legacy Acquisition Corp. With an experienced lens and an entrepreneurial spirit, she, can, she contributes and leads areas of the company's 300 million plus IPO merger and acquisitions target transactions and integrations. Kimberly is a member of the Executive Leadership Council and a network of the nation's most influential African-American executives. She's also a member of the Women's President Organization and a lifetime member of National Black MBA Association. And last year, Ms. Blackwell has been named by Gucci Inc. to the Changemakers Council. Thank you so much, Kimberly Blackwell, for being here. Glad to be here. And then uh, last but not least, Tanya Sam. Tanya Sam is a, a tech savvy investor that has made her mission to empower the next generation of minority entrepreneurs. As a director of partnerships at Tech Square Labs, Ms. Sam has mentored over 60 companies with women and minority founders and helped invest in over 50 companies that have generated over 100 million in revenue and also leads the Ascend Atlanta program that supports minority and female founders and also co-founded uh, Built Women, a business accelerator for business for, for female entrepreneurs. And most recently she was announced, she announced the Ambition Fund and investment company focused on funding women and underrepresented business owners. Thank you so much, Tanya, for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> this is so exciting. I am just so elated that you all are here. I'm such a big fan. And so we're going to start off with something light. You know, it's been quite an interesting year. So we want to know kind of one trick and tip that you have gotten used to or have done while working from home to get through the whole crazy. I'll start. Um, so I have learned that um, my lifestyle is actually called quarantine because I work from home all the time. <laughs> so, 
I had to figure out some other ways of like getting out and uh, maybe planting. So I became a new plant mom of four generous plants. Yes. <laughs> Um, so that has been my little uh, trick to like staying sane, uh, continuing to stay sane in the home. What about you all? We'll start with Kimberly Page. Uh, so yeah, so for me, in addition to obviously all of the the serious things around the pandemic, I, I have been loving the memes. Quite honestly, <laughs> the memes have kept me laughing all day. When you're on Zoom calls for eight to ten mm -hmm. hours a day, it's these like little moments of joy and laughter. And uh, my dear friend, uh, Kimberly Blackwell is notorious for sending them to me. When I have meetings. And so, you know, it's just those little, little, little moments. And, and, you know, we are just so creative as a people and community. So I have just been really enjoying all of the creative content out there during this time. Yes, I'm loving those memes as well. <laughs> very fair point, very fair point. What about you, Kimberly Blackwell? Um, I kind of dovetail from the humor to where I am really uh, enjoying the empowerment of the culture. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we have mastered technology in a way that merges an intersection between who we are as a people, uh, where it is that tech falls into this. Um, you know, everything from the versus battles, um, you know, it really has put uh, the culture um, on a pedestal in a way in which we can all stand proud and who we are um, and what's to come. Because I really do believe that they flipped the industry on its head uh, and uh, I'm here for the ride. Perfect. Perfect. It's so true. I love versus. I was like, this is what we need right here. And it's like yeah. so cultural. And, and you know what? To that point, too, I mean, I think it'll dovetail into what we need to talk about, you know, how you monetize, you yeah. know, where we use our gifts and technology uh, in creating new business streams. Mm -hmm. um, so anytime we can look at things end to end, um, you know, and I, I love how we're getting more serious and seizing our power in you know the value chain of business there perfect perfect absolutely what about you tanya um well i will go in a little bit of a different direction because i feel like you know the work has always been here and we liken it nowadays to groundhog day you know and i think i'm on a panel with women who are, i know are workaholics in the best most positive sense of the word we just do it all the time whether it's from our phones our houses our offices planes um so i've really um delved into things that help me to balance this um, my peloton bike i'm obsessed mm -hmm. with <laughs> um wine and also <laughs> i'm gonna keep it real that's real <laughs> so, that is um, real uh, my book club my online book yes. club it's just a way that i can like escape and use technology um <laughs> to still interact and connect with people so those are the things that have kind of kept me a little bit grounded through this crazy hectic hardcore work period that's so true. I, I I I wish I built that exercise muscle. Like oh I'm still working on that. You life. still can. <laughs> you still can. It's not too late. Can I just say something? Because I think uh, oftentimes when you see women on panels, like you know, we're like, yay, you know, we're supporting one another. But just literally yesterday, Tanya and I were talking about her book club, and I was like we need to figure out a revenue business model around your book club. And, yes. and if you think about kind of the environment by way of publishing and, you know, black authors and the fact that she has built this amazing uh, community around reading during this time. I just think, again, we're, we're constantly like, we're supporting each other, but we're always having those business conversations as well. Yeah. So, so true. That is totally exactly what we need to go ahead and think about some brainstorming sessions around that. would love to help there as well. Um, so as we all know, 2020 has been one hell of a year. Um, and so how have your companies been dealing with the impacts of COVID-19? And what specifically do you think it's, it's impacted on Black women entrepreneurs? Uh, you all can answer this. Um, to the best you'd like. We'll start with Kimberly. Um, so, you know, definitely at BT, our mission has, we've always had a dual mission, right? It's always been about providing great content, but it's always been about our community, right? And 
while everyone else is is doing, you know, black content, I think what we've always tried to do was not only just report on black content, but change outcomes for our community. So as you can imagine, during COVID, it was, you know, a moment where we knew probably four to five days in that this was going to really you know, like severely impact our community. And um, for us, we started talking about, well, what can we do? And so we've tried to, whether it was, you know, raise dollars to go immediately, you know, directly to some of our hardest hit um, high skewing black communities to standing up new content that we would not have reported, you know, outside of this environment. And the fact that we're dealing with essentially um, three different crises, if you can imagine, from pandemic to economic to the social just justice. Um, so it's been it's been busy. I mean, we are we are tired, but really motivated by the notion of if not us who and so being able to be in the content space during this time has been has been really really powerful and i think has um just been a function of you know who we are as, as an organization but for me personally um just the power of what we can do when we when we rally and try to really save ourselves and so being able to um look at opportunities not only for the business but again some of those partners and unique collaborations that we've tried to stand up during this time has been really powerful and i think really uh, to me it's more about that that is now becoming our way of being and operating outside of the the, the pandemic so um a lot of work we're really excited and proud about some of the things that we've done that's so beautiful it's it's been definitely a challenge but i've definitely seen our community stand up and really support one another so it's been incredible to see that what about you kimberly um you know uh i own and operate an advertising agency that supports the interests for fortune 500 corporations so for us it was all about an immediate power and pivot um, we had to become very reactive but in some ways we were prepared and how we looked at engaging from a consumer uh, um, connection piece. And so we got into virtual uh, very deep uh, and very fast. Um, wow. So we had to look at how technology became our best friend uh, in the ways in which we kind of accelerate the, the amplification um, in a different kind of 2.0 and where and how we wanted to meet consumers where they are. Um, I'll tell you that, you know, as a business owner, I am very passionate about female founders. And so with the adverse impact hitting um, many women and black women business owners with over 40% that will be adversely impacted by the pandemic, um, I've also been kind of wearing my personal passion hat uh, mm -hmm. and working with a lot of banking institutions, looking at ways in which we can provide access to capital, um, ways in which we can look at partnering and finding uh, relief in the recovery. Um, because again, you know, when the general market gets a cold, Black America gets pneumonia. And it's up to us in how we react and respond to that. Um, but again, going back to the business phase of PMM, I feel like we were ready. You know, I tell my folks, you know, as a business owner, you can't afford to be in the now. Um, you always must be thriving into the next. And so we almost met the pandemic where it was uh, by preparedness. That's amazing. Antonia? Oh, that I'm just to echo um, Kim's words right there, you know, for in terms of entrepreneurs and helping to coach entrepreneurs, you know, I always say like, if you cannot build a business for today, you have to build it for five years in the future. And I think this is a lesson that everybody needs to take, you know, because all of a sudden everything ground to a halt and we had to go to this virtual world, which is basically what tech is. So mm -hmm. it was one of those like a real lighthouse for people, no matter what business you are building today, it has has to be technology enabled. So, you know, the restaurants that were like, oh my gosh, I'm not using these apps of DoorDash and this that were behind the curve that suffered. And so I think just being able to take that lesson to say like, what does my business look like in five years? Today is just not good enough. Um, and then the second thing that I think that really came out of this and this was, you know, sort of, I think uh, a confluence of COVID, the Black Lives Matter and the social unjust, we actually saw a light being shined on the disparities for funding for African Americans, Black BIPOC founders who have been saying for a long time, we're not getting the funding, we're not getting the meetings we want. And, you know, it's obviously a horrible tragedy the way this had to sort of crack open this system. But I think there is a huge benefit to it because we're seeing much more funding being just pushed out there. And now is the time to really 
buckle down and build your businesses, make the connections. Like Kim says, it's coming from corporations down, from founders up, but it's, I mean, it sounds crazy when I say this, but picture one of those like cash grab machines you'd see on the Price is Right. This is it. <laughs> this is how people look back 10 years from now and go, that's mm -hmm. how I made my millions, mm -hmm. like right now. Right. Um, so I think that's that's a good thing. We've got to, we've got to ride the wave. Absolutely. That is definitely one of the shining examples of what came out of it, of seeing now there was additional access um, and shining a light on black founders. And so the grant money, the, the different people who crowdsourced and brought money to, uh, forward for black businesses and giving additional access, totally, totally right. Um, I just want to say one thing to that. I'm not saying that because there's money out there, it makes it easier. Right. I'm just mm -hmm. saying there's money out there because the work mm -hmm. is always going to be hard, but okay. it's out there in a bigger way. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you all have been extremely successful and and a lot of our founders are here to want to know really kind of how you got started right uh, in the beginning of it all. And what would you actually give advice to founders you wish you knew before you started your entrepreneurial journeys? Um, what was is like one piece of advice? We can start with you. Um, you know, I started my business 21 years ago, right out of college, a 600 square foot apartment um, and have scaled it into a multi-million dollar enterprise. Um, and I say that not to brag or boast. I say that to the point what Tanya has mentioned in that, you know, I've survived uh, an economic downturn. I've survived 9-11. Um, I will survive and thrive in a pandemic. Um, you know, being an entrepreneur um, is not for the faint of heart. Um, you will learn that there will be highs and there will be lows. Um, but, you know, for me and looking at things and understanding how I bootstrap my business, uh, hindsight, I wish I had been more engaged and informed to the access uh, and resources of other organizations, whether it be um, the National Minority Supplier Development Council, uh, the National Women's uh, in the sense of we bank uh, enterprises and business council uh, and the certifications, all of the professional organizations and groups, the government programs through SBA, the incubators, the accelerators. Um, there are organizations designed to help micropreneurs to scale. Um, I think too, you know, uh, I have developed my four Ds that I wish I had attacked much sooner and earlier as an entrepreneur. Um, and they go like this, you know, the first one is really how do you get clear around differentiation and who you are within your product and or service? The second one is uh, looking at diversifying. How are you diversifying your networks to make sure that you are coming out of your comfort zone into uncomfortable areas of contact that may lead to contracts? Um, the next one I would say is looking at how you disrupt and where is it by way of transformative ideas and innovation that you are bringing marketplace solutions. And last but my, not least, and my favorite D for entrepreneurs and founders, dial for dollars. Um, you have hmm. to be prepared in how you look at um, business by way of opportunity. And, you know, there's a confidence that I didn't have early on but I would really coach and counsel folks to adopt that mentality much earlier than I had in dialing for dollars. <laughs> that is so, so correct. I think that's also what we find with a lot of our founders here is the sales part. They'll have the great idea. They'll have a, a good sense of like maybe who to target, but actually getting in front of those people and being just tenacious and making sure they are ready to like go out of their comfort zone. So thank you so much for that. Absolutely. Uh, Tony? Oh, this is a great question because I feel like I'll just tell, I'm, you know, 40 something right now and I'm just such a different person than when I was 20. And I often think about what I would tell myself. And I think, you know, there's so many things. Um, number one, I think that nobody is coming to save you and it's up to you. And that I think for entrepreneurs, you know, oftentimes everyone's like, well, where's the money? Where's the this? Where's the this? And it really comes down to you. And Kim made a great point. She said 20 years later, it's not overnight. It's not this, but you have to know that if you put in the time for 20 years, 
you're going to get where you need to be. And there's this expression that, you know, we have written on like our whiteboard and it's the best way to, the best way to predict the future is to create it. And I never used to understand what that meant, but it really is a testament to your work. The future will materialize if you manifest it and it all comes down to if you put in the hours. And that doesn't mean that you won't make mistakes along the way, but you just have to really put in the work and be very clear about what you want. And this is something now that I'm older that I hear it and it makes perfect sense. But in your 20s, you're just like, you're not, you have to have the focus. You have to have these five and 10 year goals and focuses. And maybe this takes a little bit of age that it comes from. Um, but the second part of that that I'll add to it is if you don't know, get a coach. And sometimes people ask about mentors and how do I find a mentor, especially mentors that look like me. Look, sometimes you aren't going to find a mentor that looks like you. And I think the best part is great. They don't look like you because that teaches you to think outside your own cycles, your own group of girlfriends. So find people who can help you do these things and visualize them. Mm -hmm. That is such great advice. I, I mean, especially the coach part, me personally have been wanting to figure out maybe I should get an executive coach or consider a, a coach to like help. And then when I, uh, I think I saw a quote uh, or Oprah talking about she has four coaches or something like that. I was like, oh, all the oh, successful God. people will tell you. And I'm telling you, and it is a level up that you just don't know. And you're like, well, I'll do it next year when I reach this. When I, and it actually helps you reach your goals faster. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Wow, that's incredible. Um, well, Kimberly Page, we are so proud to have BET as a partner with Black Women Talk Tech. We know there's a serious gap in investment for Black founders, and we all want to really change that. And you have a storied career in investing in Black women, particularly in your most recent role. Um, BET is the leading network for Black women. So why have you spent your career making sure Black women succeed? And what is it about Black women that make us good ground investment, right? So I'd love to understand your perspective. Uh, well, I think first and foremost, I am the daughter of a Black woman. I am the mother of a young Black woman. And more importantly, I know who we are and I know our work. And so I will tell you, if I am ever dealing with a business opportunity, both large or small, if I need support, the first person I'm going to call is, you know, a, a black female. And, and it's, and it's not because of, of, you know, I don't think men can do it. I just know, again, who we are and the fact that our artistry, our, our, our resilience, our beauty, our brilliance is, is, is proven. Right. And I think that um, to Tanya's point earlier, we know all the inequities that are, have been in existence for forever. And I think what I try to do is not necessarily, you know, um, complain about those, but the, the real value of being able to write multi-million dollar checks is being able to support other black women. And shame on me if I'm at the table and I'm there alone. And that has been a core fundamental, that's who I am as an individual. So nothing that I do by way of, uh, you know, business practice is different from who I am as an individual. And I think it's that congruence and alignment that make me effective and successful. And at the end of the day, I think, you know, we always are, you know, the expectation, as we all know, whether you're an entrepreneur or an entrepreneur, is that, you know, we got to hit it out of the ballpark every time. There, there, there just no, um, there's not a lot of patience for us not being successful every time. And if I know that those are the odds and that's the mandate and ex ex expectation, I'm going to surround myself with people that I know that can deliver. And so for me, it's never really um, this notion about um, if it's just, you know, these are these are proven women on this panel who I would call every day and, and currently work with. Um, and so I think that's that's our unlock. Right. It, it, it is literally when we decide that we can show up for one another and support one another truly to advance business and be able to be at the table again, whether you're inside the organization or out. I think all of those things are very important every day. We're, we're trying to put points on the board. And I think, you know, you've got to have the right team. You've got to have the right board. You know, as you mentioned, the coaching and all of those things are so important. And so I'm here for that. I think, you know, um, I've bet on black my entire career. Even when it wasn't about black, I made it about black. 
<laughs> Even they were like, well, we don't, we don't really serve that community. I'm like, well, yeah, yes, we are today. And I okay. think it, it really is because of that perspective. I know when I often talk about this notion of ROI and not necessarily return on investment, but return on influence. And because I know who we are and when we get behind a brand, there's no investment that you can make that the trajectory of our community behind a brand, it's, 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 it's unmatched, you know, quite honestly. And so, you know, for me, whether you sell wine or widgets, if you're not connecting with our community, you're, you're not going to be a successful business. And, and that is the realities, which I think, unfortunately, some are really struggling with. And I think, you know, for us, it is really about um, showing that day in and day out and being able to be successful. It makes me, you know, one very proud, but definitely, you know, I, I sleep really well at night. <laughs> really mm -hmm. well at night because I know who we are and I know what our worth is. And I think one of the, uh, as I was listening to, you know, the two entrepreneurs on the call, I think one of the things that I try to help with is oftentimes as entrepreneurs, when you're working with corporations, you don't even know how to monetize your value of what you're bringing to the table. And, you know, having, you know, a, a consulting business for, for a, a brief period of time in my career, that was always the biggest challenge. It's like, what do I charge? Like, what do I charge? And so mm -hmm. you have to have you have to have people within that environment, within the marketplace that can say to you, listen, you're way underbidding your cost, you know, and, and here's what we would normally pay. And so it's very important to have, you know, a broad community of, of, of people around you that can really give you that insight. It's like, no, we just signed a contract for X amount of dollars. You know, you're way too low on your bid, you know, et cetera. And so I think that's part of the whole notion of our community and how we can really help one another. Hey, I want to say something real quick on that. Um, only because um, Kim walks the talk. And I say that because, you know, uh, our agency sits as a, a client and partner. Um, and this isn't the first company that, you know, I've had an opportunity to partner with her on. But we have to get more comfortable with uh, doing business unapologetically with, you know, strong entrepreneurs. You know, um, I have to dag near like plea for business sometimes with people that look like me and for the people who don't look like me, it's not the same experience. Um, so I think we need to have some honest conversations too. And Kim mentioned it. I'm actually just the opposite. I know what to charge because I know my word, <laughs> but there are folks who don't. Right. But the problem is, and I'll give you an example. I had a African-American executive come to me and say, Kim, you do really good work. Uh, we put you amongst the best with our other agencies, but your price point is higher than the other black firms, not the other firms, the other black firms. Wow. So I respectfully had to say, hey, you know, I know where we sit in the sense of competitive pricing yep. and I know the value of our product. And so I'm not going to change my prices by way of rates. Um, because the work meets the weight, you know, and so I think we have to also um, understand. Now, I do, I will dial back, you know, when I was just trying to get in the door of corporate and I just wanted that first corporate contract, that's different, you know, and so there's an evolution and a journey. And so I don't want to mislead folks as not to say that, you know, I was making a lot of concessions around things, um, but I do think there comes a point. Uh, when we as, you know, uh, black executives and black entrepreneurs, particularly those of scale, need to be a little bit, if not a lot more um, mm -hmm. confident in the decisions that we make, because it shouldn't be about, oh, well, Kim knows Kim. Mm -hmm. No, Kim and Kim do great work together, period. That's right. Okay. That's right. So, yeah. you know, we need to get a lot more uh, okay with that as we look to elevate uh, black entrepreneurs as a partner within the supply chain of corporate America. Absolutely. That makes a complete sense. And we've actually just completed a study last month. It's the largest study on black women tech founders. And we found that if you're a black founder, you're 70% of us are solo founders. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when you're a solo founder, you don't have that soundboard right. to kind of figure out what should I be charging? How to kind of you know position things? And so we found that to be a real challenge um, for our founders. So absolutely great points around figuring that out and really just being able to ask and putting yourself in a you know competitive but strong position. 
mm-hmm. and not being afraid to ask for what Absolutely. you're worth. Absolutely. That's definitely a challenge for women, especially black women. Yeah. I'm yeah. Like, all the time. I'm like, why are you charging ten cents? I don't understand. Like, this is incredible. What, yeah. what you're yeah, building. I think you know. Um, someone asked me probably a month or so ago, like, what's missing in the in the whole diversity and inclusion conversation? And, and I said, this mm-hmm. is the exact subject matter. Uh, yeah. Because as much as we want to, and, and rightfully so, let me be clear, as much as we want to hold others accountable, it's how are we standing up to support one another? And, yeah. you know, I have often had my hand slapped, but at the end of the day, I had the best results in the company. So I'm like, now what? Like, here's, mm-hmm. you know, there's a lot you can talk about. You can't talk about my results. And yes, I got it with this person and with this partner and with this agency. So I think we just have to stand up. And, and, and as I said, you got to put the points on the board. But at the same time, to Kim's point, you got to be unapologetic because all business is not good business. And sometimes yes. you have to say no, you know, so um, mm-hmm. if they're not willing to support, um, if, you know, your, your business model and how you, you know, feed, feed your family and feed, you know, obviously your employees. I'm just going to hop in on that and say two things, because I think this is really crucial, even in the chat, you know, what both the Kims said, and part of that is like your team, you need a team. And oftentimes we, I see so many solo founders. I see, you know, people who are building companies all by themselves, or they're looking to just break in, find, you know, a team of women around them. And like, these are the places to do it. You know, the chat here is a networking tool. There's so many other places out here. So the days when you would come to this and you wouldn't bother paying attention in that chat, there are people in there who can be your supporters, your ride or dies that are right. interested in the same things you are. Cause it might not be your sister or your best friend, but it's like, how do you find those Kims that mm-hmm. are going to call you and be like, girl, did you ask for a stake in equity? And you're like, you're right. That really happened. Kim did that to me like three weeks ago. And I was like, Oh, I didn't, she was like, Nope go back and do it, you know, and you need to find those people. And sometimes it takes the courage to just go up to someone and be like, hi, do you want to be my friend? I like to talk about tech stuff. Yeah. It's whack as all get up, but you've got to do it. And it grow, mm-hmm. it, it's about fostering and nurturing that for years. I mean, you know, it's not just, it takes time to build those relationships, but it is so important and it pays off like infinitely, like break out of your friendship groups and find friendships based on business, smart thinking, pushing yourself, all of that. Exactly, exactly right. Um, So I have a question for Tanya and Kim Blackwell. You two are entrepreneurs turned investors and business owners who have definitely been there and done that. So can you tell us about an experience where getting, um, you were getting a no from an investor and how you turned that into a yes? So my, mine is a little different in the sense mm-hmm. that, you know, my business is 100% mine. So I didn't really go out to seek investors for any of the stuff that is currently in my portfolio on what I've owned. But I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to Tanya. But I will say that I, every day I go out and get, have to get people to bet on Kim Blackwell mm-hmm. and Pamela. So, okay. so for me, the bet is not necessarily as an investor. But the bet instead is in, you know, who we are as an organization and as a company that actually leads to business development, that actually leads to multi-million dollar contracts. Um, so it's the same approach in the sense of spirit and philosophy and that you are selling, you know, what it is that you within a value chain bring that no other partner uh, can bring in a way that is unique and immeasurable. You know, uh, you want to be able to explain in the sense of where and how uh, there are dividends in the partnership and what is it that makes you unique to the prospect by way of investment. So for me, mine wasn't really, I'll be able to answer more on the investor side, um, but in the sense of kind of looking at seed and or angel uh, capital funding, not my experience yet. Okay, that's fair. And the, the interesting thing about that, um, based on our report, that's the majority of the Black women's experience, right? Because VC dollars have been um, historically very low. Um, last year, it's been 0.006% of all VC dollars actually came to Black women. So we are um, technically funding our own businesses. And so bootstrap is the way to go. And so that means you are funneling your money through all your customers and clients, right? Now, you say bootstrap is the way to go. I would challenge that. 
That was my way to go. But I think that there are harder ways in which we can look at, you know, uh, I think there's some great companies out there that are doing different new crowdfunding models. Um, You know, I am proud to say that I am an investor in Don Dixon's PopCam. I'm an investor Mm -hmm. uh, in Angela Benton's Streamlytics. I'm an investor Mm -hmm. with Jewel Burke Solomon with Collab Capital and how they go out Mm -hmm. and seed into other uh, entrepreneurs of color. Um, I will tell you, even with Don and Angela, like, you know, they just went straight to, you know, Stream Engine and other uh, sources that now allow for friends and family to bet on the individual, to bet on the idea, to bet on the company by way of product and or service in the sense of where the industry and analysts uh, believe that there are opportunities for growth and success. Absolutely. Definitely agree. You have to decide what's right for your business. Yes. And I just meant to say most of us are bootstrapped, not bootstrapped. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I just want to be clear for those in the chat. Because I don't want to be like my way to me, like had I known and then thinking ahead. And I said, differently. My money, I tell folks all the time, use other people's money. Yeah. <laughs> Well, if, if you're all that fortunate, definitely. Tanya. I'm going to say, just to piggyback on that, you know, my journey was a little bit different. I was a, a, a RN nurse. I worked in bone marrow transplant and I kind of um, inadvertently hopped into entrepreneurship. The first company I started was a beverage company. And I just thought I had this brilliant idea because I went to work with a whole bunch of smart people and we actually drank coffee to, you know, help us. Um, focus and save lives. And so I thought, why can't I take some of the practical skills I'd learned um, in nursing and apply it to formulating a beverage? So I created this beverage and I went out there and I was like, this is going to change the world. Um, And I started knocking on VC doors being like, invest in this because I'd seen it done with one or two other beverages. And I was just too early. They were like, you don't have some of the key things and you don't have really the knowledge it was to build a business. And I had bootstrapped it. Um, as we said, and you know, one of the best things that would that eventually worked in my favor to change the investor's mind was revenue and customers. Because mm-hmm. the thing about building a business is number one, you have to build the appropriate business for the right type of investment capital. Right. And oftentimes, and I see this mistake over and over again. I was building a consumer product company and I was going the traditional VC route of Silicon Valley because that's what I'd seen. And that wasn't really what they were interested in. So do the research to go and spend your time knocking on the right doors of folks that'll probably write checks into that area. And the business that I was building at the time wasn't wasn't for venture backed, right? It had a t- small tech component, but it just wasn't a good fit. So I got hundreds of no's and I was just, you know, it's disheartening. And I remember someone telling me this expression of either be bitter or better. You can be bitter that Mm -hmm. they didn't like me. I was black or I was a woman. They didn't understand my vision or you can just get better. And I got better, which Mm -hmm. meant I went and looked at my business. I got more customer, more revenues. I had more active users. And then people can't ignore that because now you have something. And I think that is, was really, really key at how I looked at building businesses and looking for investment. And at that time, um, you know, I was able to raise a small fund, friends and family, and I was able to get um, small loans and grants, which were helpful, but I spent a lot of time barking up the wrong tree, for yeah. sure. Yeah, I think that's so important in it, because I think oftentimes we think that it's about money. And I think that there's um, so many different models out there, but, you know, sometimes it's just about access and expertise. Yep. Sometimes you, you may not even know what to do with the capital if you get it right to your point around where are you in your own development and phase of development and growth and really being intentional about I'm at this point of my business. This is what I really need that that may be a little premature. I mean, I yes. was 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 doing a lot of I'm, I'm laughing when Tanya mentioned beverages, but mergers and acquisitions that while I was at Coca-Cola. And so many of those companies thought they wanted to be acquired and be, you know, um, integrated and incubated within one of the largest distribution systems in the world. And, and it killed their business. Yes. It killed their business. They were not ready for that massive amount of distribution mm-hmm. because they had not really built that pent up demand and velocity. Right. So it's one thing to say I'm available and I'm on the shelf. But at the end of the day, you got to turn just like all those other big brands who have millions and millions and millions of marketing dollars an investment plan. And so as as a business owner and founder, you really have to know what does my business need right now? What does my business need this next phase of development and be intentional? Because I think it's a lot to say, yes, 
I'm excited. I want to go full bright. And then you're not ready. You're not ready. And so I, I think it's just really being intentional and really understanding the dynamics of, of where your business is. Absolutely. This conversation has been so good. I wish we had another other hour because I, I didn't even know how fast this time clock went. I was like, oh my goodness. Um, so we have uh, a couple of questions in the chat. I'd love to ask um, some of them. So um, from Steph, Miss Steph Jones, she asked, are there any educational resources or mes mentorship on making deals or negotiating? Ooh, this is a great question because this takes work and study. Um, and it, you know what? I'll tell you what the best thing I've seen lately, because there's lots of podcasts that you can go, but this is going to sound really weird. Um, but, and I don't know if you guys, has anyone been on the Clubhouse app? Oh, yes. And it gets a lot of flack. It gets a lot of this. But one thing I've really realized about that is if you are doing any sort of deal, if you're negotiating, if you're valuing, you actually have to, there's a native language that people talk. So mm -hmm. sometimes you can go in and you're, you know, and this is where it's, I mean, it, this is might be a really improper thing to say, but like, you need to know the language. You can be yourself, you can be your sister self, but you need to know the right terminology and words. And it takes study. It takes listening to other okay. people go through the deal process so that you understand exactly what they're saying. And so I've actually found um, Clubhouse is really interesting because people are having those conversations over and over and over again. And it's like you learn the language, you learn the nuances of it because you can read it in books like, you know, um, you know, zero to 50 Peter Thiel's book and the startup mm -hmm. books, but you have to understand the talk. Yes. And this is something that I think people miss oftentimes because we're really like, I want you to see me for myself, but you still have to learn how the, the, the talk is in the background so that you can assimilate into both rooms. Um, that would be my answer on that right now. Yeah, I, I will co-sign what Tanya said. I mean, for me, um, I do deal flow um, and every day, you know, I'm still learning. Um, and so, you know, I'm on the FinTech board it's a six member board. Um, I have lead investors from Wheels Up, Campus Apartments, a whole bunch of different places. They're talking uh, a love language amongst species. <laughs> and, you know, again, so for me, you know, it was, it was, you know, it's, it's constant, it's a constant and continuous learning curve. Um, to Tanya's also, you know, to her other point, um, there's always ways you can go look from an educational study plan and what's in the kind of like the self-help, but it, it really is kind of like for me, baptism by fire. Um, and, and, and I love it, you know, um, for me, every deal becomes a new way of educating and learning. Um, I'm pretty well versed. Um, and, you know, I think, again, as we look at particularly at this group of black female founders, um, you know, we have to go in over indexed in uh, understanding uh, just really what the deal itself is. Um, I'm one of those people, too, that I try to add value by, mm, you know, how I kind of look at the deal maybe differently. Um, and I think, again, when you bring nuances by way of consumer segments um, and ways in which they can kind of look at things differently, it just, you know, it, you got to submerge yourself into deal flow. Yeah. I mean, it really is one of those things that, you know, you could go to the best of best in Harvard Business School. Um, but there's something about being in the room, something about, you know, really kind of in the problem solving in areas of opportunity for the business and forecasts and analysis, you know, that really comes by being in the game. Yeah. And I would say, I, I mean, I think what both um, Tanya and Kim said is it's just that notion of being a student and learning. I will tell you, every time I am in a, you know, exploring a new opportunity, I hire a consultant. He does all of my negotiations by way of my comp. He knows questions that I would never, ever think to ask. And I'm like, oh, they'll do that. He's like, uh, yes. And so mm -hmm. I think we just have to really understand sometimes, you know, if if you don't know it, try to figure out someone who does. And I think we have to also, as, as Black women, get comfortable talking about finances and, and share yes. information, mm -hmm. right? Because I think we... We, real, we keep information very close to the vest. And if I don't tell you, then then you're not going to know. And then I'm not going to know. But at the end of the day, if we share, I mean, I think about, you know, the, the Friends model many years ago when they finally disclosed who was making what per episode. They were like, listen, we're all going to like hold tight together and make a whole bunch of money. And I think if we can 
we, yeah. we, we share all other information, right? And again, you don't have to share all the details, but if you don't, if you don't know it, and I think to that point, get into some of these conversations. So if you join Clubhouse, don't go to your friends' rooms, go to some yes. other rooms to try to like broaden your horizon. But if you don't know it, figure out, you know, call anybody and just say, Hey, I'm, I'm looking at this. Do you know some person? If they might not know it, they'll try to connect you with some someone else. But I think we're we're constantly learning it and constantly recognizing what we know and don't know. And I'd rather invest that little bit of money to help someone negotiate my comp package for me that's a yep. well worth investment as far as i'm concerned because you just never know what you're leaving on the table and so that would just kind of be you know some of the counsel that i that i would share there amazing thank you so much ladies this has been so amazing we're already like almost at time but i just want to sneak this one last question in if we can give, give me additional two minutes um but I think this is one thing where, you know, we're all founders and a lot of us are looking to figure out how to really get investors to truly say yes. Because a lot of times when investing in um, us, there's they come up with all sorts of excuses. Yeah. And so tell me about a time when you were skeptical not to say no, and then you ended up saying yes. And what were the factors that really made you change your mind on, on that decision? because that is really a big part of us really trying to get the capital we need into our businesses. So I'll start only because I was on the other end uh, of, of the table. And you know, mm -hmm. it really nets down to what's your story? People buy stories, they buy into a narrative. And I would say there were many times where it was like, we were going through the diligence process and certain things felt really good, but then certain things was like, oh, that's a little iffy, but you just buy into it. And I, I fundamentally believe that people buy products and they join brands. And so as a founder, no one's gonna tell your story better than you. And you have to figure out what is what is the why behind the what? Because the what is what you do. That's, that's the tangible, whether it's your service. It's the real why that investors want to, want to better understand because they know if there's a real why behind it, when times get tough, you're gonna you're gonna persevere. You're gonna push through, and that's 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 the 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 some of the non tangible things that people investors really obviously. There's an assumption that there's some basic metrics that you're delivering. First, let me just stop there. But I think when when it becomes like you know all of these things are equal, there's some value in, in people feeling connected to who you are as a founder and your story. And we've seen it. I mean, that's that's the marketplace that we live in today. People are really connecting not with just the product, but they're really trying to buy into. I want to buy into Tanya. I want to buy into Kim because I value who they are as individuals. And there's an ethos around who, how they move and how they operate that I that that I can kind of gain confidence in that they're going to be successful no matter what, no matter the odds. And that's what I think, you know, what I try to do day in and day out as a marketer and, and, and as an entrepreneur, we want to know the story. We want to know the backstory, how you got here, how you overcame and, and what you're really, you know, kind of giving people an, an opportunity to connect and be a part of. Awesome. Any other? Yeah, I mean, I, I, Kim said it so well. I, I say it all the time. Good brands focus on the work. Great brands focus on the why. And so mm -hmm. for me, it is really um, when I'm looking at it by way of, you know, investments. And I say this in all humility. I have vested seven figures plus in counting um, in minorities and women and in the market as it relates to, you know, good business ideas. But when it comes to us, I'm really betting on us in the sense of, you know, the individual, uh, where I, where in which I think that that individual has a way to capture and disrupt the market and have the attention of the market, um, you know, and, uh, you know, I'm just, you know, really excited about some of the black women that I've placed big bets on Mm -hmm. And I uh, hope that it, you know, just multiplies for them. You know, for me, it's it's an investment and it's great to make money, but I'm excited about what's in front of them. Yeah. That's awesome. I'll just chime in on that really quick. I know we're almost out of time and I'm going to take mm -hmm. um, just the straight up take off my black woman lens um, and just, you know, answer this from this perspective of just the average VC investor. And at that point, when you're sitting in front of them, it's really not about philanthropy. It's, you know, there is all, it's always about color, but it is truly about how you can make them 10x their return. 
-hmm. And so when you're sitting in front of them, they're looking at you and they want the story, they want all this, but they want to understand how once they put that money in, you are going to magnify it and multiply it. And they're not your friends. They're not, you know, here to save the world. They just want to make money. And it's right. brutal. Yeah. And it's true. altruistic. But you they know what? Know you, know, you are right. Because when it I see my different investor groups, it's there is a different in conversation that is occurring. Yes. And that is the conversation that occurs often, if not mostly. <laughs> Absolutely. And they, and in the here, ones that the only color they like see is green, and that's money green. Mm -hmm. And so it's not personal, it's not this. So my point is, is be ready to pitch your business in a way where nobody can deny it. You know, most investors aren't there to help you build a business, like, oh, I have an idea and I want you to help me. They ain't got time for that. They have 500 other things to do. So when it comes to you, they need to know that you have the special sauce that can make that story that you've now told them come to life, right. that you can get customers, that you can get revenue. And most times the relationships that you'll make with a, with a venture capitalist or anyone, it takes time. There's very few instances where they write a check the first time you pitch or the first email that you send. Yeah. So you got to go back and back and back and be like, oh my gosh, I saw your kids. They're cute. Like all that crap. <laughs> and just at the end of the day, it's about, it's about customers and revenue. If you have, if you come to someone and you have no idea, no traction, they're like, come back. And so that's an example of something where I've seen a lot of early stage founders, even, you know, we run a startup battle where people will apply four or five times. They finally get to the semifinals. They don't make it to the semifinals. They've applied now. It's the eighth startup battle right. and they win. Because it's not like I sent you an email and you didn't respond. How many emails do Kim and Kim get a day? Right? So that's my, my, my thing. And Spot it's on. like kind of the, the whip of it because we're in an inclusive space. But, you know, and there's other, when you're out there really trying to hustle your wares, it's cutthroat. Definitely. Thank you so much, ladies. This was amazing. People needed to hear this today. And we appreciate BET, thank you so much for allowing us to have this panel. Thank you, BET. <laughs> and so, ladies, we want you to have a great day. And everyone else, please join us on the main stage for an uh, in depth uh, discussion around the Face of the Founder Report, betting on Black women as the next billion dollar tech founders. And then we'll, you know, end it all with cocktails and coffee. So, <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you for having us. Bye, everyone. Bye. Stay safe. Bye, ladies. Bye-bye.